Hello. Hello to you all. My name is John Lyon. Mr. Marshall asked me to give the presentation tonight on the history of the Town Historic Center for one very good reason. You see, I'm honored to say that the original Clinton Town Hall was named after me. It was called Lion Hall for many years because when I died in 1920, I left the bequest of $10,000 to build a town hall in Clinton because there was none at that time. I had a lawyer practice in Hempstead, Long Island and a farm here in uh, Statsburg. And I had some very close friends in Clinton and I gave my request in their memory. Here's a photo of me in my earlier years. Before I continue, you may wonder about my wearing apparel. As any speaker will tell you when asked to present, the first question is what to wear. Well, at the many banquets and social gatherings I attended with my fellow lawyers in some of the finest hotels in New York City, this is what we would wear for special occasions. So I chose this for today's special occasion. I was sorry to see the beaver skin top hats go out of style some years after I died. They were pretty classy. I can tell you that the beaver population was not very sorry to see them go. But back to our town hall. It didn't get built immediately because there was disagreement as to where it should be located. Up to then, town meetings were held in Schultzville General Store, shown here before it burned in 1930 and was rebuilt. And sometimes the town meetings were held at the Clinton Hollow General Store, which had a large room on the second floor. This was a popular room in the community for dances, plays, and town meetings. This disagreement, believe it or not, was so heated, it got to the point that 200 residents signed a petition that the new town hall should be built in Clinton Hollow. However, my executor made it clear that I wanted it in Schultzville, which was more centrally located. And when former George Budd offered to donate part of his farmland in Schultzville across from the church, the decision was finally made to build on the present site. In October of 1923, excavation began for the cellar using two teams of oxen. The building was completed in 1924 and the principal carpenter was Sherman Hoyt, who lived next door. The Clinton Historical Society recently displayed the complete set of over 100 vintage tools that he used to build the town hall. The tools were found in a Poughkeepsie building about to be demolished, and fortunately were saved and donated to the society. Notable features of the building include a beautiful varnished wainscot walls and ceilings. Strangely, even after 24 years later in 1948, when an eight by 10 concrete block extension to the building was constructed for the adjoining men's and ladies restrooms, they were still privies, no flush toilets. The toilet stools with modern two-piece seats had pots removable from the outside for cleaning and emptying. Around 1960, a stage was constructed with a theater curtain and dressing rooms and was used for community one-act plays and melodramas. The stage today is where the town board is seated. It is interesting to note that all town offices were in the town hall except one from 1965 to 1985. Town clerk Kelsey Wirehouse operated his office around his dining room table in his home shown here in Pumpkin Lane. He was a former dairy farmer, a lifelong bachelor, and very popular in the community. More often than not, visits with Kelsey for marriage and hunting licenses were lively and memorable, rarely brief, and usually included a story or two, or three, or more. His passing in 1989 at age 80 was a great loss to the town. In 1988, a major addition to the town hall was the core annex built with funds donated by resident Betty Davis as a memorial to 
to her late husband, Putnam Davis. Up until that time, court appearances were held in the homes of the local judges, except when a trial was held, in which case it was held in the town hall, but in temporary makeshift fashion. This courtroom was a fine and badly needed improvement and serves the community very well. One Clinton artifact on display in the town hall is a school bell from the tower of the Shellsville one-room schoolhouse. The bell was originally from the Hudson River Barge Enterprise owned by Shellsville resident Captain James Tripp in the early 1900s. In 2004, Betty Davis and others formed the Clinton Town Hall Restoration Committee to spearhead a fund drive to do major work on the building, including replacement of the asbestos siding. No tax dollars were used for this restoration, indicating great civic pride in the community to support the effort. This was the result. The next major addition to the town historic center was the library. In 1965, a group of Clinton citizens worked with the town board to establish a reading center in the loft of the Clinton Town Hall shown here. Prior to this, residents had to go to libraries and other towns to check out books. With town supervisor Horace Culp's leadership, the board voted to appropriate $1,000 to fund the center each year through the Mid-Hudson Library Association, which donated 2,000 volumes for the startup. On April 3rd, 1965, the Free Art Library opened and was named the Town of Clinton Community Library Reading Center. It was not an official chartered library, which would have required a full-time paid and trained librarian. The staff consisted of 25 part-time volunteers who were trained in library operations by the library association. From the beginning, children's programs included story hour every Saturday and summer programs included reading and presentations on Clinton history, puppet shows and sculpture demonstrations. The center also offered framed art on a four month loan. From 1965 to 1973, the population doubled to 3000. With increasing circulation and added books to the shelves, the floor to the reading center loft began to seriously sag, as did the bookshelves, prompting safety concerns. Also, the loft could not hold all the available books and many were stored in the attics of private homes. In December 1973, a group of residents formed a committee to replace the reading center and raise funds to build a standalone library structure next to the town hall with a connecting passageway. However, the town board, needing additional office space, proposed an alternative. The town would build a basement for a wing added to the town hall, install a furnace, and use the basement for offices. The library would inhabit the floor above, which was on the same level as the town hall meeting room. The library portion would be financed entirely by donation, donations with no support from taxes. The estimate was $35,000 including furnishings. And when 12,000 in pledges from donors and fundraisers was achieved, the decision was made to begin the project in April 74. To reduce cost, many services were donated, resulting in a total cash expense of only 19,000, a little over half the original estimate. It was dedicated on May 1st, 1976. The new library still did not meet the standards of an official chartered library. And technically it continued as the Clinton Community Library Reading Center. In 1984, the center included in its lending services, films, Polaroid instant cameras, talking books and framed art. It also advertised a sewing pattern exchange and a Dungeon and Dragons Club. Family films were part of the summer program. Finally, on December 12, 2004, meeting all requirements, 
status as an official chartered library was achieved with a new name, Clinton Community Library. Financial support continued to be from the town budget, which became a limiting factor in delivering the new services that were desired by the library board. In 2017, with strong community support, a resolution was passed that enabled the library to raise its own annual funding. With a large and varied offering of services and events to Clinton residents of all ages, the library was awarded the prestigious Joseph S. Schubert Library Excellence Award in 2019. The Clinton Community Library continues to be a great asset to the town and a facility of which its presidents can justly be proud. The next addition to the Historical Center occurred in 2011. The town board recognized the need for additional space for town officials. While one very costly proposal was to build another large wing opposite the library wing, the town board under the direction of town supervisor Jeff Burns embarked on an ambitious plan to take two historic buildings in town, move them to the town hall site and restore and utilize them for office and community space. The first project was the Spooky Hollow Schoolhouse built around 1850. When the Hyde Park Central School District was formed in 1939, this school was closed and students went to Hyde Park. Charlie Clay bought the property which was adjacent to his farm at Rusty Lane and converted it to a mini civic center. He restored the building, added a kitchenette, a stove, a sewing machine, a phonograph, piano, ping pong table, and pool table, all of which he acquired at auctions. Nearly 1,000 books of the old school library were housed in the building for free borrowing by any adult or child. The building hosted parties, meetings, dances, Red Cross sewing sessions, and more. Charlie's simple rule for using the building, leave it as you found it. By the late 1980s, the building had not been used for many years and the Clay family donated it to the town for community use. At that time, the Clinton Historical Society organized work parties to clear away the brush and cut down invasive trees in the hope that the building could be restored and utilized by the community. The result of these volunteer work parties was this. However, lacking funds, it deteriorated badly over the next 25 years of non-use, including a leaking roof. When the town board's project came, only the walls could be saved. And shown here, you can see one of the walls being mounted on a new timber frame. Here's a close look as the wall is lifted into place. The basement was constructed earlier and then the roof was added. Today, it closely resembles the old schoolhouse and keeps the original 170 year old walls. It houses offices for the town supervisor, the assessor, the recreation committee and the tax collector. The second historic building to arrive was the Masonic Hall in 2012. The building was built with a bequest from Schultzville resident Theodore Schultz, who died in 1862 at the young age of 23. Shown here, shown here in his large portrait that hangs on the wall in the, in the Masonic Hall. He gave $2,000 and land to build the hall in Schultzville and which was completed in 1865. Prior, the Warren Lodge No. 32 Masons had been moved, meeting in Lafayetteville and were organized as a moon lodge. This meant that they would meet on nights of a full moon so that travel by wagon and horse was less dangerous in the dark. The organization continued to grow and in 1958, major additions were added to the structure a kitchen wing for banquets and a rear room that housed the pool table. The lodge had over 50 members at the time. 
However, as with other organizations in recent times, like the Grange, membership dropped, and in the 1990s, the few remaining members could not maintain the facility. They were about to sell their hall to the Hyde Park Elks, which would mean ownership of one of Clinton's historic landmarks would leave town. The Clinton Historical Society did not want to see this happen, and an arrangement was made. The Masons offered to donate the property to the Society, and ownership was transferred in 1999 with three agreements. The first was that the Society would restore and maintain the historic building. The second was that the Warren Masons would continue to hold their meetings in the hall. And the third was that the building would be used for community purposes. The society formed a subcommittee, the Masonic Hall Preservation Group, which recruited many town residents who restored the building through volunteer work parties and held fundraisers, notably the open mic sessions and an annual Valentine's dinner party this younger group attended every year, as did the principal supporters, Gary and Linda Stokes, owners of the Schultzville store shown on the left. Here is the building before rest restoration and after rest restoration. However, after 13 years, the group was unable to find other civic organizations to utilize and support the building. At that point, the town board and the historical society reach an agreement to transfer the property to the town for a nominal purchase price and move it to the historical center location one quarter mile down the road. Now, if you're wondering how such a building gets moved, it is not by cranes and, and flatbed trailers. The first photo shows that the side and rear wings from 1958 were removed, leaving the original 1865 structure, which was raised and set on wood cribbing. Next, the building was lowered onto hydraulically self-propelled wheel assemblies at front and back, as pointed out by the blue arrows. Then it was steered onto the center road to begin the trip to the town hall site. All movement was controlled by a contractor at the rear who was operating levers that ran the wheel assemblies. This photo is interesting because it shows passing the Christian Lions Church which was also built in 1865 from another bequest from Theodore Schultz, who gave $3,000 and the land for its construction. And here the structure has arrived at the site, driving onto the concrete floor that was previously laid. Here it is in place with the schoolhouse in the background. And here the basement walls were then built. The building was lowered onto the walls and a new rear access addition added with an elevator, completing the project as it is seen today. So the three agreements are still met. The building will remain restored. The Warren Masons still meet in the community room on the second floor, and the building continues for community use, including offices for the town clerk, the building inspector, and others. Town residents are very proud of our very unique and beautiful town historical center. Shown on the left to right are the 1865 Masonic Hall, the 1850 Schoolhouse, the 1924 Town Hall, and the 1976 Library. Town residents owe a debt of gratitude to Jeff Burns and the town board whose thoughtful vision has become a reality to benefit us and future generations. And it, is, it expresses the high interest that Clinton residents have in preserving its, its historic sites. Here's the board that can take credit. Jeff Burns supervisor, the late Michael Apollonia, Dan Budd, Dean Michael, and Frank Venezia. As an added note in 1955, the town erected this memorial to military veterans and located it in front of the town hall. The plaque reads, Memorial to the men and women of the town of Clinton who served the country in time of war. Clinton uh, Civic Association, town of Clinton. Let's now go to Wings Hall. Before I passed away, 
Over in Clinton Corners, there was a very popular place of entertainment called Wings Dancing Pavilion, later Wings Hall. This was the brainchild of Smith Wing, who owned a home and barn across from the 1777 Quaker Meeting House. The full story is told in a chronicle by his daughter, Irma Wing, who later played cornet in the Wings Hall Band. Smith told his very reluctant wife that their barn could be transformed into a dance hall and it would be successful using local musicians, including their son, Roy. I can just imagine his wife's reaction, looking out the window at their cow barn and saying, Smith, you wanna do what? But she relented and the dance hall was born. Here is his advertising poster in 1908, his second year. These early days had dances three times a week in the summer and would attract as many as 600 people, many of them summer boarders that provided extra income for many local farmers. Summer boarding was really an important local industry to help support farming. Smith's son, and Smith's son Ed and his wife took in boarders as shown in this photo of their idle wing cottage, which still stands across from Jeannie Bean's store in Clinton Corners. It also served for several years as Harold Fountain's place of business. The hall enjoyed great success from the beginning, causing Smith to keep adding onto his barn until it measured 40 feet by 80 feet long. Young and old alike came to the dances, as you can see in this photo. Look closely where the arrow is pointing and you'll see a long horizontal thick metal ride, rod that can, ran from one side wall to the other for structural support. There were several of these rods and were only six feet above the dance floor. So tall dancers had to be very careful not to hit their heads. Fast girls came in large groups, shown here. Smith did have his rules. No alcohol. Gentlemen could only go on the floor if they wore coat, tie, collar, and tie. And a posted sign forbid dances like the tango, the turkey trot, the Texas Tommy, and the bunny hub. The Clinton Regional Good theater, Summer Theater Group would entertain during intermission, as did local talent. Here is the soda bar where nothing stronger than soda was served. Soda and homemade ice cream cost 10 cents. Square dances were very popular and great for social mixing. And here is one of the bands that played at the hall. Masquerades and moonlight dances were much enjoyed in those early years. Some of the favorite dance songs included by the light of the silvery moon and in the good old summertime. Mr. Marshall received an email from a former resident who lived next door to Wings Hall and wanted to share some good memories she had about the dance hall. She wrote, I lived next door to Wings Hall in the 30s and 40s. On Saturday nights, my brothers and I would sit side by side by my bedroom window and listen to the music and sounds of the happy dancers. On Sunday morning, we went to the grassy area in front of the hall and found coins that had been dropped and soda bottles that we turned in at Roy Wing's store. We got two cents for some, five cents for others. Pretty interesting. And Jean Burkowski, and Jean Burkowski, aged 98, living in Upton Lake, recounts her memories as a young lady in the late 1930s. She said, Wing's Hall dances were a special treat for me if I was a good girl. Roy Wing was a master of pianist. No liquor inside, but BYOB was practiced outside. The ladies' room in the second floor of an extension attached, attached to the barn, and it was a privy, no indoor plumbing. The uh, fragrance was overpowering. Laughing, Jean continued, as for the men, well, they just watered the shrubs outside. In 1920, Franklin Roosevelt came to Wings Hall to speak at a Democrat rally and complimented Irma Wing on her cornet playing. The hall continued in the 1930s and 40s, and here's a World War II poster advertising a war tax. By the time the hall closed in 1950, 
It had been in continuous operation for 43 years. Some years later, the hall was used by the Garden Club for floral exhibits on Community Day. After standing for 100 plus years, the ravages of time took its toll, as seen in this photo, revealing, revealing a wavy roof, signaling severe foundation problems. For safety reasons, the barn was demolished in 2009. One notable occurrence in past years of Wings Hall was that Jeff Burns' parents met at a dance at Wings Hall. And I'm wondering, if they hadn't met, would we have a Jeff Burns today? And if not, would we have a town historic center? Food for thought. It is notable that the entire town of Clinton, in the entire town of Clinton in the 20s, 30s, and 40s, three major sites for social events like dinners, dances, and plays were within 200 feet of each other. First, there was Wings Hall, then the Grange Hall across the street at the Creek Meeting House, and the Friends Church, one door down from the, from the Creek Meeting, from the Grange, from, <laughs> sorry, from Wings Hall. At the Wings Hall closed in 1950, square dances were held across the street at the Upton Lake Grange in their Creek Meeting House. Well, that ends our story of the Town Historic Center in Wings Hall. I'd like to thank the Clinton Historical Society for use of the several of the images from their archive that you have seen today. And thank you for your kind attention. Before I go back to rest in peace, are there any questions?